and welcome to the Spectre of Communism podcast. This is our last episode of the year, and appropriately enough, we'll be discussing probably the defining political event of 2023, the escalation of the conflict in Palestine, the attack by Hamas, which was met in response uh, by the IDF with a brutal campaign against Gaza, which has already killed upwards of 20,000 civilians. We have two speakers joining us today to discuss what is happening with the Palestine Solidarity Movement, uh, how communists and members of the IMT have been intervening in this movement, the kind of repression we and attacks on free speech and assembly we face from the states, but also what communists say about this conflict, what we say about Palestinian liberation, what we say about the fight for a Palestinian homeland, and how to put an end to all the bloodshed and despotism of the region. So on my right, we have Khaled Malakai, who is a leading member of Socialist Appeal, soon to be the Revolutionary Communist Party, British section of the IMT. Khal, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, Joe. It's a pleasure to have you. And on my left, we have Hamid Alizadeh, who is an editor for Marxist.com. You'll recognize him if you listen to our last show, International Marxist Radio, talking about world relations and so-called multipolarity. So, Hamid, uh, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you for having me, Joe. So, uh, Cal, I'm going to speak to you first because I know that you can speak personally to the consequences for standing up and solidarity with Palestine. So before we get into the weeds, why don't you just uh, appraise our listeners of what you and our comrades in Britain have faced? Absolutely. Well, I'll set the scene a little bit in Britain as to the conspiracy of silence that we've seen in the press just about how large the, the Palestine protests have been. About a month ago, there was a million people out on the streets of Britain alone. And um, the movement has not just been against the actions of the Zionists, but against British imperialism, not just the historic role that Britain has played, but also to this day. And so the government has attempted to shut it down as quickly as possible and use all means at its disposal to cow the movement and to crush it. And our not-so-missed ex-Home Se Secretary, Suella Braverman, told the police to use the full force of the law and she branded all pro-Palestine marches as hate marches. And so the Met Police chief, feeling the pressure from above, clamped down on protesters, and I was caught up in the midst of this. Uh, it was just over a month ago now, when 11 people were put on the Metropolitan Police's Twitter account, accused of racially aggravated alarm, harassment, and distress. Essentially inciting a manhunt against our comrades, yeah. at, amongst others in these demonstrations. No, absolutely. And they made ap appeals to the public to identify these alleged uh, criminals, these alleged enemies of the state, which were seen by t hundreds of thousands of people and shared by some of the biggest right-wing channels in the country. And so, they, as you say, Joe, they generated a manhunt and so we sought legal advice and we decided to go into the police station to fight this politically. And when we arrived there, the responding officer was completely unawares that this was taking place. She actually looked aghast at the idea that they would do such a thing. And we ended up waiting five or so hours to find out whether or not we would be arrested or charged. And then when we finally got into the interrogation room, it was very clear that they were underprepared. They had nothing to say. In fact, the only evidence they had of uh, this alleged offense was a picture of us at the protests. And so we called this out for what it was, a political attack, uh, an, an attempt to silence and censor pro-Palestinian voices through intimidation and public stunts. And this is a common feature around the world where pro-Palestine demonstrators have been identified by the police. They operate on a sort of catch and release policy where a lot of these arrests don't lead or, or invitations to speak to the police don't actually end up in convictions, which suggests the intention is to harass and intimidate and try to force the movement to police itself. That's absolutely true. We've seen this uh, protest in Manchester, protest in Scotland as well. Um, it seems to be the guiding principle to give the impression that something is being done. And the Met Police have actually complained about how it's very difficult to clamp down on this protest movement because actually, for, for the most part, certainly for the majority, people are remaining within the confines of the law. 
Yeah, there was an amazing article by the um, head of the government's anti-terrorist commission <laughs> basically saying, oh, it's a real shame that these people aren't committing crimes. They're committing <laughs> just below the threshold of the law, which means we're not allowed to arrest them. If only they'd obviously break the law, or perhaps we'll have to change the law. Yeah. And we should say this is an international phenomenon. There's been a general, I would say, McCarthyite clampdown on expressing solidarity with Palestine in one country after another, in, in the US, in France, in Germany, Austria. Our comrades have also faced attacks. I'll put links in the description of this episode to where you can read a bit more about how our comrades have faced and also faced down this repression. Because, of course, we're not going to be cowed in the face of this kind of intimidation, are we? No, absolutely not. And I would say that these attacks come from a place of weakness rather than strength. And it comes as part of a slate of repressive and anti-worker legislation that we see not just in Britain, but across the world. Here in Britain, though, they've been attempting to clamp down on protest movements for years now. Mm. Since uh, the, the explosive events of BLM, the, uh, the protest movement against the death of Sarah Everard that was killed by one of their own officers, you had the police and crimes bill brought in two years ago, which uh, attempted to disrupt um, any protests that could be seen as effective. The nationalities bill was also introduced to deport people at the stroke of a pen. And the minimum services bill is going through Parliament at the moment. I think it's passed now, which suggests that uh, certain strike action should be made illegal. So it's really mm. shown the sham of bourgeois democracy. Yeah. And you can feel that anger on the streets. And of course, these are all weapons that the state's putting in its back pocket because they expect there are going to be um, strikes, protests, reactions against the increasing crisis of capitalism, the mm. immiseration of the working class and youth in the future. Can we talk a bit more about this question of, of freedom of speech? Absolutely. Because this is held up as a sacrosanct liberal value that any democratic society, you're allowed to say whatever you like within the basic limits of hate speech and incitement of violence and this sort of thing. Um, but it seems like this uh, universal value is not so universal. Absolutely. Well, yeah, we have seen just how partial and incomplete these rights are under capitalism, the rights to assembly, the rights to protest and the rights to speech. And what determines these questions is the class struggle itself. Democratic rights are not these things that stand above society irrespective of circumstances. They serve a purpose, and Lenin was very clear about this, to give the illusion of freedom and fairness in bourgeois society. And so they can be dropped by the bourgeois any time that is needed. And the most astute members of the bourgeois recognize facts like this, such as Winston Churchill in this country, who said democracy is the worst form of government. It just happens to be better than the other ones. So the appearance of democracy plays an essential role in the maintenance of capitalism. Mm. And of course, the stereotype is that communists are anti-democratic, that we support dictatorship mm. and that we're all about silencing individual freedoms. Um, but that's not the case. Communists stand in defense of democratic rights, but we do so for different reasons uh, and with a different perspective than mm. do the liberals, for example. That's for, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, democratic rights and the fight for them are a means of furthering the interests of the working class for mm. communists. Because we understand that full-body democracy will always be impossible under capitalism, but the struggle for these freedoms needs to be linked to the struggle for workers' democracy, mm. for full-bodied freedoms for, for the working class. Mm. Yes, and as Trotsky said, uh, any attempt to limit the legal parameters of speech and assembly um, will be used to repress and attack the working class in the future. Uh, we understand that these are weapons and handholds that we can use to fight for our interests. But let's go a little bit beyond this question and solidarity, obviously, from everybody involved in Spectre of Communism uh, for the attacks that our British comrades have faced. But Britain has a particular relationship with Israel. British imperialism plays an especially pernicious role in this question and has done historically. So can we talk about that? Can we talk about Britain and its stakes in Israel-Palestine? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's very clear by the response from the political establishment when it comes to the question of Israel, because whether it's Starmer's Labour or uh, Sunak's Tory party, they have both sided with Israel, with the oppressor. And to make sense of this, we have to understand foreign policy as an extension of home policy. It is these, uh, these politicians that are very happy to attack the working class here in Britain, play hardball with nurses, doctors, teachers in their struggle 
for uh, better paying conditions. And it is these uh, reprobates that are very happy to attack, of course, the poor and oppressed across the world. So they don't give a damn about British workers here in this country. They certainly don't give a damn about uh, the interests of the poor and oppressed across the world. Mm. And obviously with Israel specifically, I mean, perhaps we'll come back a little bit later when I speak to Hamid. But all the way back to the Balfour Declaration, British imperialism has a particular legacy Mm. um, with regards to Palestine. And Britain today, it has all sorts of ties to Israel, diplomatic ties, trade deals, it's got military agreements and this sort of thing. And all these interests, of course, trump not only the rights of workers in this country, but certainly the lives of innocent Palestinian men, women and children abroad. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's something that we have to be very clear on when it comes to the question of this war, because we have seen a lot of pacifistic phrase mongering on the part of the liberals that talk about just how bad war is, not really understanding war uh, as we do, which following what Clausewitz had to say, war is a continuation of politics by other means. And in fact, this war is a result of peace on the imperialist terms in the first place. And so when we uh, when we're addressing the question of war, we have to be very clear that War is a part of capitalism, and to struggle against capitalism and war is to struggle against imperialism. It's to fight back against the entire rotten system. I mean, we talked about the you know, the hard nosed reactionaries, I and mean, obviously the Tories back Israel to the hills, and they're shameless in doing so. Attack the liberals and their hypocrisy. But I have to say, the leaders of the labour movement, by which I mean the trade union bureaucrats, the TUC, they've been at best, I would say, conspicuously absent mm. on this question. Um, what's happened to the basic principles of working class solidarity when it comes to the mass organizations of the working class? It's it's a very good question. And I think it's something that a lot of rank and file trade unionists are asking themselves. Yeah, because thousands of them must be present individually on these demonstrations, but they never seem to be there bar a few local initiatives with the with the banners i mean where are the unison blocks where are the unite blocks where are the the gmb blocks yeah it's a very good point and in fact once the uh, the war broke out following the events of october 7th the palestinian general federation of trade unions put a call out to their class brothers and sisters across the world and they had three things to say firstly we need to re- we need the workers of the world to refuse to build weapons destined for israel Secondly, to refuse uh, to transport weapons to Israel. And thirdly, to take action against companies involved in the siege of Gaza. And this is something that the British labor movement absolutely needs to uh, stand up to. We see, as you were describing before, Joe, Elbit Systems and Raphael, two Israeli-owned arms manufacturers, they operate in Britain and play an essential role in the Israeli war machine. Also, there are c- essential components of uh, the uh, the F-35s, the stealth aircrafts that are now raining down hell on Gaza, that are made in Britain. Now, where are the calls from the leadership for the workers to go out and strike? There's been no such calls, I would say. And you can see that rank and file members are taking things into their own hands. They're taking up the call of internationalism. There has been mass pickets, mass protests, the call for other trade unionists to join. And our comrades have been involved in these struggles as well, passing model motions, condemning Israeli imperialism and calling for a new intifada as well. Mm. I mean, we can look to the example of the Rolls-Royce factory workers in Scotland in the 1970s who shut down their factory rather than allow components to be sent to Chile for use in Pinochet's warplanes. I mean... The, the working class and its organizations, if organized, they could completely isolate the Israeli war machine. I mean, I'm not talking about just in Britain, but throughout the world. I mean, imagine if the massed ranks of the working class was to say not a single nut, bolt, screw, circuit board or shell is going to leave our shores intended for use against innocent Palestinians. And that's the power that the working class really has. But I suppose I'll have to ask you again, why is it that the trade union leaders don't seem to be making this call? What are they so afraid of? I would say that uh, they're afraid of the movement getting out of hand because of the anger that exists on the street. A lot of the people that are involved in this movement have, of course, been massively radicalized by the uh, the attacks that have happened over the last 15 years of austerity in this country. Mm. And we saw the working class really come to life in the past year. And a lot of the burning class issues that were thrown up, nominally over pay, but over conditions of working life, 
have not gone away. They have uh, sold a lot of these struggles down the stream. And of course, any inkling of workers taking matters into their own hands can take them into territory which they would feel very uncomfortable in. And that's what workers' boycotts play the role in doing. Uh, it's a stepping stone in, in showing the workers where the power really lies in society mm -hmm. from the role that they play within production. And this, of course, should just be the, the starting shot. It is workers that should be in charge of what is produced in the first place, and it can throw up questions like that through the struggle itself. If we really want to see welfare and not warfare, we need to have the factories in the hands of the working class as well as the commanding heights of the economy. Yeah, I think also it is interesting because uh, the TUC has the power, in, in Britain at least, uh, and similar federations elsewhere. Yes, yeah, so CGC in France, for example. Yeah, they have the power to completely paralyze society. Mm -hmm. They can stop everything from working because the work, the power of the working class is such that nothing works without its permission, in essence. Uh, and then here you have the biggest protest movement in recent history of up to a million people taking to the streets, hundreds of thousands of people on a weekly basis taking to the streets, even more out people out there being outraged at what's going on, at the complicity uh, 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 of of uh, of uh, British uh, the British ruling class, uh, British politicians, and, and, and the British state in all of this, and here and they haven't done anything, and that's precisely why they haven't done anything, mm. because this movement is going to the heart of matters, bringing out all, as Cal said, all of the class hate, all of the the accumulated class hatred is being channeled through this issue mm. all of the stuff that people have been seeing for years and years that the corruption the you know the complete decrepit and opportunistic uh, way of operation of the politicians of the establishment of the media all of this is now being focused is being concentrated into this issue where you know ten several million defenseless palestinians are being bombarded by one of the most advanced militaries and the British government, the British media, all of these are completely behind it. It 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 just put it just paints out the picture so clearly that um, taking the lead is would would mean take it's me, having a confrontation against the British ruling class. Right. But we have to say that it's an absolute scandal that this protest movement, as I said, the biggest protest movement in recent history, which goes deep into the working class is being organized by groups of activists yes. rather than the organizations of the working class which were built for this. Yeah, I mean, the fact that activists individually feel the need to take things into their own hands shows the lack of lead. Mm. And we talked about the trade unions, but it's also true of the mass reformist party. And in Britain, Cal, uh, what can be said of the Labour Party under Sir Keir Starmer? <laughs> well, it's almost as if he's forgotten everything he must have learned in international law because he seemed very quick to jettison uh, the concern for international law for the Geneva Convention when it comes to carpet bombing, uh, the use of white phosphorus on, as Hamid was describing, the generally defenseless uh, civilian population. So all of that has gone out of the window because clearly for him, he is proving to big business that he is willing to do their bidding. And in fact, on many points, positions himself to the right of the Tories when it comes to the question of Ukraine, the question of Palestine and Israel. Well, migrants well. just yesterday where he said, if you want to have fewer migrants, then vote Labour. Absolutely. Absolutely. It really puts me in mind of the movements against the Iraq war, where similarly you had these huge demonstrations, big marches, but ultimately they began to fizzle out. They began to lose energy and resolve and people were still angry, but they had to go home because no one was offering a lead, no one was offering a plan, even though this this movement has been very impressive and it's been very inspiring. You know, a million people on the streets of London, for example, it, it seems to me that in the last few weeks, turnout has been dwindling and mm. I can't help but feel that's because no one is offering a plan. No one's saying, well, we need to do this. And it's, it's such an open goal, as Amib was saying, if the working class was to actually marshal its forces and it could paralyze society and actually... Uh, stop this bloodshed. But I think I want to put to both of you now um, a point which I think is really 
deeply ingrained in the public outrage against the situation in Israel-Palestine because, and, and, and that's the hypocrisy. It's the hypocrisy of our rulers, the hypocrisy of our politicians, the hypocrisy of the media establishments. I mean, when um, Russia invaded Ukraine 22 months ago, um, there was an absolute hail of condemnation and every attack on civilian infrastructure, you know, real and imagined, every time uh, missiles landed on civilian homes, um, every time anything happened in the Ukraine war, there was uh, outrage about genocide, about ethnic cleansing, war crimes and so on. I mean, double the number of civilians have died in the space of two months in Gaza as have died in the entire Ukraine war. The utter double standards of our ruling classes have been completely laid bare. What does this say about the nature of the system that our politicians represent? That they are motivated by the concerns of British capitalism first and foremost when looking at the situation here, which as we've already kind of outlined, uh, Israel is an important prop to the regime. It profits from its dealings with Israel, it arms them, and as a result, it will back them to the hilt. And I think that's why no amount of moral pressure is going to lead to Sunak or Starmer developing a conscience overnight or recognizing the wrongdoing. Right. And it's also why the political establishment can't help but be at so out of touch with the mood that exists in the country at the moment. Because also, uh, you, you mentioned the Iraq war. It's been 20 or so years now since the war on terror began. And what most people see that as is the West's monopoly on violence and terror and unleashing that on whole swathes of the, uh, of the earth. And as a result, I think people don't believe a single word that comes out of many politicians' mouth. They also don't believe a single word that is printed in their press. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's an interesting one. Um, you know, for, for years and decades, you know, they've been talking about Western values and democracy and, you know, we just talk about freedom of speech and humanitarianism and this and that. And uh, while especially people from the Middle East have been uh, described as these uh, terrorist, feudal types of <laughs> backward uh, fu Muslim fundamentalists uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, but <clears throat> I think really in this situation you see the true Western values that these people are talking about. Mm -hmm. Or really, it's not really Western values. It's not the values of the Western working class or ordinary people. It, these are the values of the establishment of right. the ruling class in the West, which is what? Which is the indiscriminate bombing of thousands of uh, people. What is it? They say 25,000 tons of bombs. Bombs mm -hmm. have, been, have been dropped so far, at least. Uh, upwards to 20,000 people uh, have died. The vast majority of these have been uh, civilians. Um, Biggest group within these have been children. Um, yeah, these are the values of these uh, these uh, people, and we see now what I think most people today, whether they whether it's consciously or not, but I think the this idea of our values, our democratic values, and so on and so forth, has really lost its value, so to say, mm. in the eyes of the of of the of of huge uh, parts of the population in in, in the West. And that's dangerous from the point of view of the ruling class, right? Because these ideological pillars of their rule are important. And when they so openly flout them, then it can cause people to have deeper questions about the nature of the status quo, about the system. Yes, precisely. Because what comes out now is, then what is hiding behind this? What are the interests? What are the interests of the British ruling class? Because clearly it's very uncomfortable with what's going on. Mm. In the sense that, not the, not the, not in the sense that they care about whether people are dying or not, right. but because that they are being shown up and there are these big protests and they have to answer questions that they don't like to, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. But what's really coming out against this is their raw interests, mm. and what is that for for in this particular situation is the state of Israel as a bridgehead of U.S. and Western imperialism in the Middle East. The Middle East is a very important uh, region for, for, for various uh, reasons, in particular because of the oil and mineral resources in the region. And Israel is the most solid, most dependable, uh, at the moment in particular, uh, ally of U.S. imperialism. And it's been nurtured as such for decades uh, as, a, yeah, as an outpost, really, of Western imperialism in, in the Middle East. And that's far more important for, the, for these people 
than the lives of anyone uh, and, and the well-being of any people of the Middle East. And that we've seen not only now, but this is, you know, this is something, it's not, it's not a new thing. This has been going on for 75 years mm. since the establishment of the State of Israel, of, of, uh, of many, many, many uh, brutal attacks, uh, uh, instances of eth- ethnic clen- cleansing. Hundreds of thousands of people have been pushed out. Seven million Palestinians are now refugees. This the state of misery that you have in Gaza. Gaza is, is described in many places as the biggest open air prison of the world. Two million people crammed in these extremely bad conditions with no prospects for any type of future. Huge uh, poverty, and, then, and and it's not much better in the West Bank, where one day you can be attending to your to your fields, and the next day. Some uh, settler family supported by uh, the, the the some tank and and a squadron of of so of Israeli soldiers, just gonna set up shop and you and take over everything you have mm. and you just have to leave. Um, that's the situation that exists and, and and obviously for these people that doesn't matter at all. What matters to them are their uh, interests in that region in maintaining a military and economic. Uh, strong post outpost sorry in 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 the region to defend their interests to mark 100 years since the death of lenin the great marxist revolutionary and leader of the october revolution our international is launching a brand new biography in defense of lenin written by rob sewell and alan woods the book traces lenin's life and works and explains his real ideas defending his colossal heritage against over a century of capitalist myths and slanders Pre-order your copy at wellreadbooks.com. That's wellread-books.com. Yeah, thanks, Hamid. And the best that both the imperialists, the likes of Joe Biden, and the so-called lefts, and even some of the Palestine solidarity groups can offer as a solution to this 75-year nightmare that the Palestinians face, the best they can offer is the so-called two-state solution. Now, we've got a good article on the site about this question. I'll link it in the description. But what do communists say about this idea of a two-state solution? So that's a Palestinian homeland, a recognized Palestinian state living side by side with Israel. Well, um, yeah, recently uh, we see that uh, Biden has come out saying that after this war, of course, he's not against the war. But after this war, what we need is a two-state solution, mm. uh, I, a real Palestinian state. The same has been uh, proposed by some Gulf states uh, and uh, and also the liberals inside of uh, Israel. And, uh, of course, the, the point is, who is going to uh, carry this out? Because these people, you've had all sorts of governments in the U.S., You've had all sorts of governments in Israel for decades, and you are ne- nowhere close to a two-state solution. What you have today is a Palestinian authority, a so-called semi-state, or it's, it's, it's a, I wouldn't even call it a protectorate. It was probably more like a prison administration, which <laughs> uh, uh, was set up after the Oslo Agreement of '93, um, and which in fact is not a state uh, at all is all of its uh, security interests are completely run and controlled by the by Israel its borders are controlled by Israel its economy is controlled by uh, by Israel one way or another and in fact in 2006 up until 2006 there were at least formally elections uh, but when the Palestinians elected the wrong uh, leadership uh, in Hamas uh, Israel, supported by the EU and the Americans, refused to recognize that government. So what kind of government can we now expect from these same same people? The fact is that the, the, a two-state solution is not um, uh, really a, a, a viable one because it would, it would... What are we talking about? We're talking about two capitalist states. And a capitalist Israel would never... No capitalist state would never, on its own accord, build up a capitalist competing state, a strong competing state, uh, it, w- right next to its border or borders or, 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 or within its uh, its uh, its borders uh, at all. Um, in fact, I would say that the opposite is true. That the Israeli, the nature of the Israeli regime 
requires it for it actually to be against this. Israel uh, as such, the Israeli state is a tool of the Israeli ruling class. Mm. And in order to maintain itself, the Israeli ruling class has based itself on the idea that it is surrounded on all sides by hostile states, hostile forces. That is what that's what has been telling the Jews uh, of Israel. Yeah, siege mentality. Basically. It's essentially fertilizing a siege mentality, uh, and saying that they need this state in order to 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 protect them. And it's been using the Palestinian question by by attacking the Palestinians, uh, by provoking the Palestinians, provoking the Arabs. Mm. It's been using this on the one hand to mobilize the most reactionary layers, build up a, a, a layer of reactionaries. The, the worst of the most uh, extreme of them are in the settler movement that we that we know of. To whip up uh, a reactionary Zionism. Mm among certain layers of Israelis, and also to subdue other Israelis, to subdue the Israeli working class, essentially, to tell them that your interest is the same as the interest of the Israeli bosses, and all of us as Jews, we have a common interest against uh, uh, Arabs, essentially. And therefore, mm -hmm. the Israeli state needs to keep up this conflict, this brewing conflict with, with the Palestinians. And on the other hand, the ruling class also wants land. It wants to expand. It wants a bigger land mass. Mm. And for that, it needs to, uh, and to protect also militarily its core interests, it wants to push out the Palestinians. If, if tomorrow it could push out all of the Palestinians from its areas, it would do so if it didn't uh, end up causing it more troubles. And many of them are very seriously thinking of using this particular um, operation as a means of giving an extra push pushing the Palestinians out of Gaza either com completely or uh, uh, partially, essentially. So in that sense, the Israeli state, without the Palestinian question, could not really function. Its whole existence is based on the conflict with Palestine, is based on using uh, the, the so-called threat of Palestine and th threat of, uh, uh, of, of the Arabs to rally and galvanize support behind itself. Uh, amongst the Jewish population, and therefore, this they will never accept uh, a, a two-state solution. Besides, from the fact that they would not want a competing, healthy, vibrant capitalist state. <laughs> the, the, who 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 would want to build that? That no 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 capitalist state would would want to do that anyway. Mm. Obviously, Israel has seen a lot of internal instability over the past couple of years. You've had Netanyahu in and out of government uh, more times than I can count. Clearly, there's a lot of instability in Israeli society as well. What effect has the 7th of October attack had on the consciousness of Israeli society? Well, that's very interesting because, you see, as I said, for decades... The Israeli regime has used the question of, of Palestine and, in general, hostility with Arab nations around Israel to subdue, essentially to um, yeah, subdue class contradictions, to push back, to, cha to channel uh, the class struggle down national and, and sectarian religious uh, lines, essentially. That's a, that's a standard practice of the Israeli ruling class. However, they have always agreed that within themselves, they would they wouldn't use this against each other. Mm. Now, that's what, what's different here is that Netanyahu, since he came to power, uh, insisting on maintaining in power, has used the question of Palestine for his own benefit. Mm. Uh, he's, he's provoked s war after war. With, every time he's been losing support, he's provoked wars with the Palestinians. He's leaned on the most right-wing, extreme reactionary uh, elements within Israel. The, the extreme right wing of the settlers uh, movement and, and so on. Um, what what this has created, this has created a rift within Israel itself because at the same time there's, there's mass dissatisfaction with the with the, with his rule. Uh, as you know, the, he's been he's been accused of you know uh, uh, loads of uh, corruption and and so on and so forth. But also this is there's, there's a big division now in, inside Israel with the extreme right wing, the settlers, and the the ordinary Israelis, <laughs> so to say. Um, and also, this has created a rift within the ruling class because the more long, how to say, sided parts of the Israeli ruling class are, are saying, you risk destabilizing things. Yeah. If you push too far, 
you're going to get a big backlash as the one we have seen now. And this is destabilized the whole the, our rule uh, in, in general, and also you will divide up the Israeli uh, population, which he's done, which mm. has done some deep, deep fractures within the population, and this is uh, undermining the rule as a, as a, as a whole. There are rumors going around, and and I don't normally like to report rumors on the podcast, but I'm curious what you think that the Israeli security forces saw this attack coming. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean they said that. Uh, Apparently a year ago they stumbled upon some documents which out outlined this whole plan. That might that might very well be tried. I don't know about that. And mm. uh, they might have uh, mis- miscalculated. Maybe they were too arrogant. They thought they had everything under control, and and then this happened, and they didn't. And this has been a big blow. Whether it's true or not is is irrelevant, really. Uh, whether they knew or not, or whether it was a conspiracy or not, I I, I doubt that it was a conspiracy. Mm. But the point it, is that all of this is bringing out. The, the 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 contradictions within Israeli society mm. at the moment it's not clearly along class lines but there's a massive hatred against Netanyahu against that regime against the far right uh, in in, uh, in 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 his government and a big majority are saying that as soon as this war is over he has to go mm. uh, and certainly that will set in motion that will be an, another step in the social crisis that's brewing inside Israel mm. where at at one point sooner or later the class questions will also come to the fore right i mean obviously all of israel's operations in gaza have been incredibly brutal but this particular operation has been especially brutal even by the standards of the IDF. I read an interesting report a couple of weeks ago from 972 magazine that talked about how Israel selects targets in Gaza and it identifies civilian infrastructure, homes, schools, civilian high-rises as so-called power targets. Mm. And the point of destroying these is simply to strike fear into the hearts of the Gazan people is to terrify them. Um, and it, it feels like the Israeli state is really going for broke here. It's it, the, the gloves are completely off. I mean, given the instability at home, what's the logic in launching such an openly and unabashedly brutal campaign in Gaza? I mean, isn't that just going to isn't that um, counterproductive ultimately from their point of view? Well, it is. But the point is, whatever they do, they're going to lose at this stage, right? Because they they that. The attack that Hamas made was a big blow because for years, for decades, as I said, they have based themselves on the idea that the Israeli state can provide, is the only force that can provide security for the Israeli working class, for the Israeli population. That idea went out of the window on the 7th of October. What you have now, in my opinion, is, is an army which is set determined on showing that it's powerful mm. that it's that it's undefeatable and so on and so forth i don't i don't i'm not sure that it's going to work by the way i'm not sure that they're going to win because what will victory look like i don't think they're going to uproot hamas uh but either way the point is they want to 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 pro- project themselves yeah. as as this you know this strong force and retake their position in israeli society but the thing is you can't turn back time yeah the damage is done and what they're doing now is actually exacerbating the contradictions is exacerbated even inside of israel you have although small but you have some this dissatisfaction with what's what's happening now and also internationally you Mm. see the huge amount of dissatisfaction coming up against what's going on and exacerbating contradictions in every single country that supports israel such as in britain for instance well bouncing off this point about class questions reasserting themselves. I know that one of the accusations we faced in Britain, Cal, is that one of our main slogans, uh, Intifada until victory, revolution until victory, which references the the first Intifada, is a hate slogan. It invokes (laughs) terrorism and violence against civilians and it's anti-Semitic. What was the Intifada? It was a mass uprising against Israeli occupation after 20 years of direct Israeli military rule in the West Bank, in uh, in Gaza. And we saw the Palestinian masses rise up like never before. The ways in which 
the uh, the occupiers would put down Palestinian resistance with bullets no longer worked. And very similar to all revolutionary events, it, uh, this attack on uh, the 7th of December in 1987 against four, uh, four Palestinians, four Gazans that were hit by an Israeli trucker, was the straw that broke the camel's back. And off the back of it, what did we see? We saw uh, a mass uh, struggle led by popular committees in their tens of thousands, uh, defying every aspect of the occupation. They organized health, protests, defense. Uh, they, they would uh, communicate through communiques and call for general strikes. They would call for commercial blocks, uh, tax boycotts, and so on and so forth. And it completely ran out of the control of the, uh, the Israeli ruling class. And this is the important point of why we stress it. It's because it, it had precisely nothing to do with the acts of individual terror, which were popular uh, at the time amongst the Palestinian resistance. And it had everything to do with threatening the foundations of Zionist rule. And that came through the class methods that were front and center of the Intifada. So you allude to these ineffective methods that the Intifada did not use in, in 1987. In terms of the struggle for Palestinian liberation in Palestine, Hamid, what's the balance sheet of the Palestinians' leadership? Well, um, as Kel said before, uh, at at a certain point, there was a heavy emphasis. Well, for for a long period, there's been a heavy emphasis on terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a heavy emphasis on Arab nationalism. Uh, there's been a heavy emphasis on negotiations. Mm. Uh, all of these, at, at, you know, at different times or at the same time, <laughs> that's that's that 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 changes. Uh, that's changed throughout time. Um, but. None of it has worked. In fact, today, 75 years later, uh, this, the, the plight of the Palestinians has never been worse. Mm. The situation has never, ever been worse for the Palestinians. Even before this war, the situation has never been worse. You have poverty, uh, as I think I said before, of, of up to 40% of the population. Uh, you have all of these millions and millions of, of, of refugees, people living in, in the extremely dire conditions. And the idea of a liberation and of a homeland has never been further away. And I think the main point is that the only thing, the, and, and we can see the only thing that has worked has been the few instances of mass revolutionary struggle. That has been the most powerful element. And that's exactly the one element that none of the so-called leaders of the Palestinian movement have uh, wanted to use. Um, now, in uh, in the PA in Fatah, basically the the, the PLO, you see uh, the the old liberation movement leaders who've completely capitulated, become just proxies of uh, of the Israeli state. In Hamas, formally, you see a group that's uh, that's uh, fighting back. We won't condemn anyone who 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 supports Hamas for that particular reason, but we don't support Hamas either. Uh, in fact. Hamas was built as what? Hamas was built on the one hand by uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states as a means to combat the left wing of the Palestinian movement, of the, of the P PFLP and so on and so forth. Uh, as a, in, in a period where Islamism was being used all over the Middle East to fight communist and Marxist uh, ideas. And on the other hand, it was built up by the Israeli state who consciously allowed it to, 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 to gain a foothold and to allow it to develop and grow, again, as opposed to the left-wing and to the, to the more, the more uh, left-wing nationalist uh, movement, uh, liberation movement. And why is that? Because from a point of view of the Israeli regime, an organization like Hamas is easier not to negotiate with. This is not just us saying it. This is public knowledge. This is mm -hmm. something you can read in all, you know, major newspapers, if, if, if you try to look it up, the Israeli state had a hand in building and fertilizing and building up, allowing uh, Hamas to build up its uh, forces. And it's been uh, benefiting from it because, in fact, the, the methods that Hamas uses doesn't actually give, doesn't actually lead to liberation for the Palestinian people. You know, just lobbying some rockets against one of the most powerful, most advanced military Militaries of the planet 
is not going to change anything. What it does, oftentimes, most of the time, is that it scares Jewish people into the arms of the state. It actually furthers the interests and the main tactic of the of the uh, Israeli state. Um, whereas when it whereas mass struggle is not something that they they <laughs> they participate in, or a struggle that goes beyond this the borders of Palestine, they don't participate in. Mm. But if we look at if we look at all of this, who who are the friends of the Palestinian people? The, you know, it's not the so-called defenders of Western democracy and Western values and so on in the West. It's not the Western imperialists. It's not the Western liberals. It's not uh, it's not the uh, the Israeli <laughs> state certainly. It's not the uh, Hamas and and the Palestinian Authority has not shown a way forward. The so-called Arab states, the a- Arab leaders, the the uh, uh, House of Saud in uh, in Saudi Arabia, the King of Jordan, the uh, the Sisi in Egypt. What what are these people doing? They're they're not doing anything. In fact, if anything, Egypt and Jordan is acting like prison guards, like border mm. guards, keeping the Palestinians inside instead of instead of actually helping them. Uh, you have Iran, who's uh, and and Lebanon and Syria, who uh, in words support the Palestinian cause. But in reality, they just use it in their own games of wheeling and dealing and trying to get concessions from U.S. imperialism. They're not actually helping expand the cause of the Palestinian people. The only people who have an interest, similar interest as the Palestinians, is the masses of the Middle East, is is the workers and poor in Egypt, the workers and poor in in Jordan, in Iraq, in Iran, in Lebanon, Syria, and so on and so forth. In fact, in uh, Jordan, you saw this movement whipping up Huge mass protests in Jordan. In fact, the majority of the population are Palestinians, <laughs> either in the refugee camps or Palestinian Jordanians. The Palestinian movement could take power in Jordan. They have a royal family is absolutely decrepit and is hated by the vast majority of the, of the population. You could have a revolutionary movement in Jordan. And then on the basis of that movement, you could wage a revolutionary war against uh, uh, against Israel, where you would actually stand a chance. So are you suggesting, and is it our view as communists, that the freedom of the Palestinian people, the conquest of a Palestinian homeland, and a decent existence for the Palestinian people, the fate of those objectives is bound up with the fate of the Arab revolution? Absolutely. That's the only way that the Palestinian people can uh, can win. That's the only way they they stand a chance. But in order to do that, they have to stand on a class basis, uh, and that means they need to break with the, with capitalism <laughs> as such. They need to unite with the workers and poor in in the rest of the, uh, the the Middle East. Fight against all of these powers who are who are all conspiring to keep not only the Palestinians but also the rest of the Arab masses uh, in their place and in check and in a position. Where they where they can be exploited and oppressed, uh, uh, you know, um, at will, and uh, and 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 take power into their own hands. Essentially, that's what we. That's that's the only way forward. Yeah, for the establishment of a socialist federation of the Middle East, and in the course of that struggle, in the course of that struggle, the working class in the rest of the world, the working class in the West, in Britain, in America, Canada, France, Germany, what have you. We have a duty to fight against our own ruling classes, who, of course, are the major allies of Israel, who prop up the Israeli regime, who use it as a beachhead into the Middle East, as Hamid has been describing, um, and to fight for socialism, fight for communism here, to establish regimes, establish worker states that could actually reach out to the Palestinians and the oppressed people of the world in a genuine spirit of solidarity. Yeah, and I would also say this. There's a lot of people in the West who say that the Palestinian issue is one thing and other struggles in the West is another. But I think that's absolutely false because right. the same people, the Western imperialists, lean. They, 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 it's the same people who carry out the oppression and exploitation of the masses in the less advanced countries are the ones who carry out the exploitation and oppression of workers here in the West. Mm. And those two things are completely interlinked with with one another, and and a, and a defeat, let's say, of of Western imperialism in uh, the Middle East or anywhere else, is a step forward for the working classes of Europe. So therefore, it's not a question of just helping the Palestinians. What we're talking about is the class struggle internationally. 
that the working class of the world has no the working class has no nations. That's what what Marx and Engels uh, wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we fight each of us it, where we are against our particular uh, ruling classes, but our interests, as such, are completely intertwined and aligned with one another. Mm -hmm. Hear, hear. Well, I think that's an excellent note to end not just this podcast on, but also the 2023 season of uh, INC podcasts, I suppose, because we're going to take a short break for the festive period. And then we'll be returning in January with a brand new series of weekly episodes starting, I'm told, with an episode about probably the greatest revolutionary in history. That's the extent of my clue, but <laughs> I, I, I promise it'll be really, really excellent and we'll be promoting a very exciting new publication from the International Marxist Tendency. So do tune in to the Spectre of Communism in 2024. But for now, I will say thank you very much to Hamid. Thank you. And to Cal. Thank you very much. Revolutionary Seasons greetings. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks if you've been listening to our episodes up till now. If you haven't, by all means, feel free to go back and listen to the ones you've missed over the holidays. I will see you in 2024.